Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly Childress. I am the manager of visitor engagement here at Stratford Hall, and welcome to Science Saturday with John Bachman. Um, today, we will be talking about the monsters of the Miocene. Good morning, John. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you very much. It's delightful to be here again. So, welcome, everybody. Okay. So, John, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Oh, there it is. All right, and we are going to start presenting. I love the slide, John. Um, this guy right here, though, not going to lie, is a little terrifying. The, yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> I know. Uh, sharks are pretty amazing creatures. They've been around for about, what, 400 million years? And uh, virtually unchanged. No, I shouldn't say that. They have changed a lot, but the basic sort of uh, water design, if you know what I mean, has hung in there for literally hundreds of millions of years. Yeah, if you click it again, it'll give you the time at the bottom. And then we go to the sneak slide. The next slide is really what we're talking about. All right. This one coming up. Uh-oh, there it is. And why do some animals get huge? You know, this is a question that uh, um, I did a series called Rocks, Time, and Fossils that tried to answer some of the most commonly asked questions that I get uh, about paleontology and, and geology. And, and, and this was one of the questions. And I never did, a, never did a program on it. So why do some animals get huge? Are you ready to go? Absolutely. Let's do this. By the way, hey, listen, guys, if you have a question, how do you want to handle the questions? During or after? I was going to say, we can um, do the questions at the end. So we'll do a little Q&A session at the end. So everyone, um, feel free to put your questions into the, the question and answer section, and I'll go through those um, once we are finished. <clears throat> Got it. Okay. All um, right. Let's go. Let's do it. <clears throat> you know... When I started thinking about this topic, uh, you know, it, it occurred to me that there's something that attracts us and, and scares us at the same time. You know, it's just an attraction, scary, about monsters. You know, look at all the popularity in, in the media about, you know, your latest version of monsters. Well, th uh, the, that, those are pictures. That's a brachytherium. We'll see him later on. Uh, they, he could reach up to 40 feet. And that guy lived uh, in an epic called the Eocene. Okay, next. Well, you know, fiction and, and books and stories and stuff are filled, filled with monsters and giants. And there's probably some sort of sociological, psychological reason, uh, which I'm not delving into, why uh, uh, monsters and giants uh, represent um, are so well represented in fiction. Next slide. But hey, you know, uh, paleontologically speaking, there have been times in the history of Earth where there really were monsters and giants. Now, that top picture there, you may not be, hey, that's really great when you have the uh, little pointer going there. Yeah. I am not uh, that I am not going to hesitate the pronunciation of this pre uh, of this Cambrian Burgess shale animal. It was the terror of the Cambrian seas um, in what is now British Columbia uh, about 500 million years ago. The big picture of the shark, which is one of the more common pictures of the guy sitting in the mouth of the megalodon, uh, that is the true size of its jaw. Wow. No, this was way pre-Photoshop time, okay? That picture is about 1920. Okay. You know, prehistoric non-avian dinosaurs come to mind. And I, and you know, when you're, when you're talking about dinosaurs, which I talk about a lot uh, and have studied a lot, um, you know, you gotta remember a couple of things. The non-avian, non meaning not bird-like, okay? Because most of the, the, you know, birds are dinosaurs. 
Um, and most of the dinosaurs were about the size of a turkey. And the only reason that we know about these huge ones is because they left big bones and big footprints. Next. One of the geological time periods that have the fossil proof of giants and monsters is, is, is during the, this Miocene epic. Next slide. Now take a look at um, you know North America. I've used this slide many many times, but this is a, uh, this is a picture of what North America would look like about 15 million years ago. Uh, if you uh, put your pointer um, on the East Coast and go up the East Coast, that's about right. Oop, go back down a little bit, a little bit further. That's New Jersey. That's Maryland. There we are. Oh, there we are. Yeah, we're in that little bay that's in, that you see. That's the Salisbury Embayment, um, lasting from twenty six million years to six million years ago. The Miocene epoch is a crucial time in the geological history of our planet, um, as we explore, you know, giants and, and giants at different times in the geological past. Okay, next slide. And again, this is a review because so many of the programs deal with the material, the uh, paleontological material and fossils and stuff that we find here about the Miocene. I've used these concepts, but it's not, it's something to remember that, you know, 26, 20 million, 15 million years ago, million years ago, North America uh, and the world was going through a number of huge, huge, uh, geophysical changes. Inland seas were drying up. The Mediterranean would dry up. The coldest continent was thawing. You know. Antarctica was shedding trillions of gallons of fresh water. Great mountain ranges, you name the continent, the mountain ranges were being pushed up. The Himalayas were being compressed by, what, uh, by a floating India that floated into uh, that part of Asia and the compression, the geological compression forced the mountains up the Himalayas, the Andes, the Rockies, okay? Um, animals and plants were adapting to new environments. Uh, the biggest one during the Miocene were grasslands. Grasslands and kelp forests. Kelp, you know, that was huge seaweed uh, forests that live now off the uh, California coast. So, but all, but all around the world, there were a lot of things happening. Next slide. Nope. What animals were the giants of the Miocene epoch? Now see, these are, this is what I'm interested in hearing about right here. These all right. monsters. All right, let's go to number one. Now, Leviathan Melvilli is the largest predatory whale during the Miocene epoch. These guys lived in the oceans in and around uh, what is now the beaches of Stratford Hall. The picture on your right, which shows uh, one of these giant toothed whales, right? Nibbling on a Carcaracles megalodon, right? Is, is proof in itself that these were true giants. This was the largest predatory whale. You know, we don't think about whales necessarily as predatory, but, um, you know, orcas, which we'll talk about later, are, and they have an interesting part of the story about giants of the Miocene. But anyway, here he is, and you can find the teeth of these guys. I've got a couple of them. Next slide. Can't forget this guy. And when I saw the picture on the lower left, of a large shark about ready to grab an elephant. That sort of says it all, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just picturing, I'm a very visual person. So seeing this, this picture on your slide and imagining that fin coming at you. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the, yeah, and sharks do live in shallow waters like it's that. It's something right out of a, a Steven Spielberg movie for sure, you know? Exactly. That is not a little elephant. That's a full-grown elephant. That was uh, that 
is about to, yeah, anyway. So then, uh, you know, you can see another picture, one of these classic pictures of uh, stand in the middle of the mouth and see how big it is. You know, that is, remember that these uh, giant megalodons got as big as on average of a school bus. Okay, next slide. Now, I'm going to read some of this stuff, uh, and I don't have any fossil stuff of this because it's uh, Morasuchus is an extinct genus. Okay, there were other species of these guys of giant crocodilians from the Miocene of South America, 40 feet long. Okay, most of people's family rooms are about 20 feet, okay, or living rooms. So double it and stick one of these guys in it. Um, and it's pronounced Morasuchus, one of the biggest croc, not the biggest, by the way, the biggest crocodile lived many millions of years earlier during the Cretaceous, but this guy was truly a monster of the Miocene. Next slide. Now this blew me away when I saw this picture for the first time. This is stupend, <laughs> check the name out, okay? Stupendimus. Geographicus, right, <laughs> was one even of the, his name means he's big. He's, he's stupendous. That's a full-grown man. He's probably about what five eight, five ten, something like that. Okay, one of the biggest turtles. Again, the largest turtles lived during the Cretaceous. But this, when I saw this picture, it blew me away. I had never. Well, it's just stupendous. You know, it's venomous. <laughs> it lived in freshwater rivers and wetlands that dominated northern South America during the Miocene. Again, during the Miocene. So what's up with that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Seeing a pattern. Right. Now here is um, a, a, a sunfish. Uh, we call them molas now, M-O-L-A. This is Ostromola angrahophori measuring up to 10 feet in length. Now you, you make a, well, you've been talking about turtles that are this big and, you know, 40 foot crocodiles and school bus sized sharks and stuff. This sunfish, the sunfish, okay, the sunfish is considered, some of the species of them, the largest fish in the world. And if you want to see one of these guys washed up recently, I, I'm not sure, it's either in Japan or in New Zealand, but uh, a, a dead carcass washed up on the beach and it was uh, immense, weighing well over a ton and a half. This is a fish, okay, Miocene. Next slide, please. You know, though, though the Miocene epic was many millions of years ago, it's only a small piece of the Earth's history. And I keep, I, I've used this slide on a number of times, um, the, it gives you up until the bottom, you notice, when it hits the Proterozoic, where it's 2.5 billion, and the one that Cambrian is, five point, is 542 million. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the slide couldn't be big enough, and it might be too confusing if we uh, you know, did it in comparison to the size. But you can see where we are up at the top during the Holocene and uh, where the Miocene would be in the geological record. Next. So why do some animals get big? You know, how come? I love this picture. Now, huh? I said, I love this picture of the Great Dane and the Chihuahua. Yeah. <laughs> you know, now, in all fairness to the uh, in scientific insight of this program, uh, dogs have been highly bred. And, uh, and, and for various characteristics, physical characteristics, obviously chihuahuas and small toy breeds are bred for smallness. And Great Danes and some of these other immense dogs, you know, Irish wolfhounds and some of those guys, you know, uh, are in, can weigh well over 250 pounds. Next slide. But why do they get big? This is a cool picture. Gigantic animals have lived throughout the long history. Remember at the beginning, I told you about that brachytherium? Well, this is a brachytherium from the Eocene, and that's a full ground, that's a tree standing next to it. This guy is related to hippos, okay? 
And uh, it, it truly, it was the, now it's not during the Miocene, but it's probably the largest land mammal, land mammal ever to live. Okay, next slide. So we're getting into why animals get big. Why do some animals get huge? And why don't they just basically stay small? Well, sometimes common sense, you know, when, when you're looking at all these pictures of these different animals that, that represent obviously different sizes, you know, so animals change, okay, to meet their biological needs. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Biological needs. Animal survival is all about adaptation. Okay, the um, fennec foxes there in the middle, right? With they're the so cute. Ones. I know they're cute. Now, maybe you know this, maybe you don't know this. They got the bit, they live in the deserts of North Africa. Okay, and um, fennec foxes have um, these big ears so that the heat generated, remember they're little mammals, so their heat can dissipate quicker in the atmosphere. So it's not just that they're eavesdropping on our friends, you know, they're, what they're doing is they're keeping their bodies cool. Of course, we know about polar bears. Animal survival is about adaptation. Adaptation. Next slide, please. Animal adaptation is an evolutionary response. It's a response to an environment, okay? The famous picture on the left, maybe you didn't know that was a real famous picture. I the, remember seeing it in science class when I was, was in yeah, school. Those, those are uh, the pictures that Darwin drew when he visited the Galapagos Islands, the famous different uh, types of, of uh, sparrow, I think they were. Now, the, what you probably spot on the right picture there, and, and the, uh, the evolutionary response that a trilobite, now trilobites were the dominant uh, aquatic life in the Cambrian oceans. There were some big ones. Some of those trilobites got as big as four feet across. They were invertebrates. They didn't have bones. Remember, every piece of an animal is there for a reason. It's, it's, it's nature just doesn't throw in something for the fun of it. It's to keep the species going, okay? So an adaptation is a response to an environmental, to an environment. Next slide, please. Now here we got, so there's a change. If you change the environment, let's change the environment. Animals either adapt, move, or die. That's about it, okay? And you can see uh, on the upper left hand, that little four picture um, set that's up there, all extinct. Um, and so they're either, they're moving. You can see the group that's moving there and uh, or dying off. The interesting picture of the, what appear to be wolf-like things, where right? those are Tasmanian plus uh, marsupial wolves. Now a marsupial, it's like a possum, okay? So these guys had little pouches for their babies, just like possums, except they look like wolves. So what's up with that? You know, how come? Because environments um, also set parameters about what animal characteristics uh, may be suitable for that environment. Convergent, the fancy word is, ready? Here's a fancy word. Fancy term, fancy term alert, okay? Convergent evolution, where you have different, uh, on different continents at different times, the stress and strain of environmental demands on an animal group will cause them to share similar characteristics. Hence the Tasmanian marsupial wolf there uh, looks pretty much like other wolves, right? but some obvious big differences. Okay, next slide. Animals depend on their physical features to help them obtain food, keep safe, build homes, withstand weather, and attract mates. Again, 
the great picture of a red fox. There's nothing about that red fox that isn't important for its survival, period. Okay, we haven't gotten to the huge stuff yet. It's coming. Next. These physical features are called physical adaptations. They make it possible for an animal to live in a particular place and in a particular way. Okay, so we got some, and uh, again, I, you know, I'm choosing these pictures to, uh, to exemplify, uh, you know, what, what we've just read and, and shared here. So you got the crocodile, crocodilian there, and you have what appear to be dolphins, all of them. Uh, living that live in a particular place and in a particular way, develop particular physical adaptations. Next slide. Size is a physical adaptation. Now, got the whale, got some sort of little desert mouse there, right? Now, again, animals don't look and act the way they do because of some sort of kidding around uh, that nature does with us. Again, everything about the whale, everything about that little guy, has their ad adaptations to their unique environments. And size is important. Now size for a little guy like that would be giving, uh, being able to lose heat size for something like this gigantic whale would also have some important things because, well, well, we'll share those in a minute. You'll see. Okay, here we go. Next slide. Now we know that some dinosaurs got huge because their environment provided the ecological advantage for hugeness, meaning there's lots to eat, right? Dinosaurs ate tremendous amount. That means these sauropods uh, these two uh, animals that are closest to us here um, would eat hundreds and hundreds of pounds of plant vegetation in a day. And again, you got to remember that they moved. Most of the, the most of the dinosaurs that we know, other other than the uh, predatory theropods like the T. Rexes and all those guys, uh, most of these guys, the big herbivores, had to keep moving or they'd run out of food. But they lived, most of them lived at a time when there were no polar caps. And when the Earth's, atmosphere, Earth's environment was much warmer than it is today. So the, environmental, the environment of the dinosaurs provided an ecological advantage. Next slide. Crazy picture. This is a giant squid, okay? Uh, and it's one of the more complete specimens that's ever been recovered. Giant squids li live in the abys uh, abyssal sections of the oceans, the huge depths of the oceans. Um, so what do we know about animals that get big? Next slide. <laughs> Being huge, this guy better be careful. Huh? Being huge, this actually happened to me one time. Anyway, being huge is an ecological characteristic. An ecological characteristic, okay? Some characteristic of the ecosystem associated with, you ready? Competitive superiority. Uh, it doesn't take too much to figure. Big animals compete and when they compete, uh, obviously this is a competitive superiority, superiority and an advantage when you are big. Next slide. Now, this is interesting. I ran across this when I was doing some research. The fossil record, right, indicates that gigantism or hugeness has occurred after every mass extinction. Now, we're going to, you know, when we talk about the Miocene giants, Miocene was 26 million years ago. The, uh, there are extinctions going on all the time, okay? There's something in, in paleontology, paleontology called the background extinction. Background extinctions happen to all genuses and species. 
every genus, every animal is subject to extinctions. There's only a handful of animals that, uh, and it can be argued that it's not even them, that have managed to survive. But one thing that the fossil record indicates is that after, after the five big, you know, you get the five big ones there, you can see the peaks there, your Cretaceous at the end there, the Permian, you can see the, uh, the Devonian and the Ordovician and the Cambrian and the Precambrian. Uh, after all the big spikes in extinction, Giganticism seemed to be one of the responses to an emptier environment. Next slide. Because mass extinctions, let me say it right here, mass extinctions change environments. Okay. Of course, the most notable one there is the, uh, is the impact of Achuxalub, the giant asteroid that slammed into the Yucatan. 67 million years ago. Uh, the middle picture is the Permian. Those are Permian animals. The dinosaurians were uh, kind of low down on the, on the list. Those are some other types of animals that lived about 250 million years ago. And then of course the Ordovician extinction barely had any plant life. And then there's also the extinction up there in the Cambrian. Uh, we're preceding it uh, right after that, we would go into what is called the snowball earth. It's history of the earth is very interesting. It's gone through tremendous changes, but mass extinctions change environments, change the environments. You got it. You're going to change the animal response. Next. Now I should ask people why I picked these slides. What are we looking at there? Kelly, what are those things? They look like lightning bugs. <laughs> they are all lightning bugs. <laughs> Changes in the environment often create new niches or living spaces that contribute to rapid speciation and increased diversity. Now, I, this is kind of cool, okay? I didn't know this. Uh, I, I, I took a nature walk. My wife and I took a nature walk. I don't know years ago, right? And, then, and it was at night, it was in a state park. And, and the, part of the thing was, let's look at the lightning bugs. And it was lightning bugs. When you see lightning bugs, lightning bugs in our area, in Virginia, and in, in well, I, I think pretty much anywhere, represent live only in certain altitudes of the trees. You have bunches of lightning bugs that are adapted now to low down within 20 feet of the ground. Then the next group of lightning bugs that you see flashing around on summer nights are in the middle of the trees. Well, they are a species that have adapted to the middle uh, of trees. And then you have canopy living uh, species of lightning bug. Change the environment, create new living species, uh, niches, <clears throat> spaces that contribute to rapid speciation. Now, I'm not sure how rapid uh, lightning bugs changed, but they changed to meet the change in their environments. Next slide. If the niches right, the little places they live, all the environments, provide changes in the amount of food available. Oh, just more food. Some animal groups will take advantage of this. So if your niches that are opened up have more food supply, common sense, you're going to have some animals that are going to take advantage of that. Next. And there's no question the world was changing during the Miocene epoch, and the animals of that time were changing to survive. This is Meriohippus, one of the Miocene horses. Now, yeah, and there's the grasslands that they were uh, that that these animals would adapt to eat. No question, the world was changing, and the oceans of the Miocene world. We're offering immense areas for food and living spaces. Next slide. Observation of present day giants indicate that they are aerobically active. Okay, so you got more food. You're gonna have some groups that are gonna take advantage of more food. And you're gonna have these big animals 
becoming more aerobically active. Now, the picture of the bear may not strike you as something similar to um, a cheetah or even like some as the speed of a rabbit or something like that. These are giant animals. This is, this is a grizzly bear. They're huge animals. And bears can, over short distances, run really fast. And people that have been attacked by bears can attest to that. So, but the, the, the interesting thing here is that one of the characteristics for giganticism is to be aerobically active. Your metabolic processes are speeding up so that your muscles can be can receive more oxygen and deliver more um, uh, energy to uh, to living. Next slide. Marine giganticism, okay, relates to increased food su supplies. Well, yes, it's like a no duh. You know, if you have more food, then you're going to have bigger animals. Well, what's the biggest environment on Earth? Oceans. Oceans, yeah. Right. And so marine giganticism is, in, is also uh, linked in with the uh, couple of things. One, obviously, the food sources, but also the buoyancy that, that is offered to, uh, to animals living in the oceans. So big animals take advantage of these buoyancies. Oh, by the way, there is the biggest turtle that's ever lived on earth. Now that was millions of years before the Miocene, but the one I showed you the picture of, that was no slouch either. So, <laughs> and th that is a, uh, the a blue whale uh, you know, there in, that, in that, that one picture. And those are the largest animals on earth. And what, what is this thing? Is that that is crab? Spider crab. Spider crab, that looks like an alien. It's- Well, you know, a uh, crabs, uh, have been around. Uh, of course, there are many, 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 many different species of crab. And this, you know, the next time you guys, you know, start munching down on crab legs or something like that, you know, you're you're eating a, an an uh, an animal similar to these giant spider crabs. Next slide. So, being huge in the offer in the oceans offers competitive super, uh, superiority. Okay, you get big. Competition determines who survives, okay? Let's just face it. I mean, you, you know, uh, if, um, if you're living in the oceans, you have a tremendous supply of food, you have space to extend your ranges. And, and so the largest animals that have ever lived on earth, uh, including the Miocene time period, uh, were the, uh, uh, the animals that lived in the oceans. That's a primitive Basilosaurus, uh, an early type of whale on the uh, one picture. That's about 30 million years old. Next slide. Giants, well, giants are usually the winners, uh, the big winners. And I mean, so if you have the right conditions, the right environment, the right space, the right uh, source of food, Animals, some animals, not all, some animals will take advantage of this and grow immense. Next slide. Hmm. Giants can tolerate a great range of environments, conditions, and are less, uh, excuse me, in, uh, environmental conditions, and are less vulnerable to predation. Well, that makes sense. They're big. So they scare everybody else off, right? So. Absolutely. I love that every time I see polar bears, I just think of the um, Coca-Cola Christmas commercials. Yes. Yeah. 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 They, yeah somebody got uh, somebody was paid handsomely for that idea. Anyway. <laughs> all right. Next slide. Let's take a look at some Miocene monsters and consider factors that have been have led to their hugeness. That drawing. Uh, I, I got. Uh, that was actually done by a student and not a, my, one of my students or anything, but I, I always thought that that was pretty cool. Those are Miocene animals. And we could come, by the way, anybody that's out there that's got questions, we can come back to a slide if you want to ask about, you know, something too. Next slide. Absolutely. 
Next slide. Okay, so here's, oh, sorry. Go back one more. Just, yeah. Um, this is what the world looked like as best we can figure about 15 million years ago. And you can start spotting, oh my gosh, take a look at Europe. That's the Tethys Sea that stretched from what is now India all the way to, I guess, England. That was an inland sea. That's not the Mediterranean. Mediterranean would be forming to the south of that. You can see India on the move to about crunch into the uh, southern part of, uh, uh, of Asia. So what was changing about the oceans? The biggest environment. Next slide. Well, tectonics were reconfiguring the patterns of the ocean. Um, as, as you may or may not know, there are 26 large plates that, uh, that and P-L-A-T-E-S, that make up the surface crust of the earth and they are in constant motion. You know, all you have to do is hold up your thumb and look at your thumb and say, I'm moving at the speed of the growth of my thumbnail. Right now, you're moving. Whether some, some of us are moving west, some of us are moving north. If you live in North America, we're moving west. But I think one of the first conversations you and I ever had, John, was about the fact that here at Stratford Hall, the Great House has moved like 60 feet since it was constructed because of. Yeah, just under 60 feet. Yeah. yeah that's going to be an interesting, that would be an interesting sort of addition to the landscape here is a, is a pole and then say, well, you know, um, since it's building in 1738, we have moved 38 feet west. So, next, next. So tectonics, big part of it. The changes in currents altered the ocean temperatures, which affected habitats food source. Remember, it's all about food. So the tectonic piece, uh, can you go back to that previous picture? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so when you change the tectonics, you change, change the ocean currents. And when you change the ocean currents, you change the environments. And when you change the environments, you are going to substitute or eliminate certain life forms that cannot change to uh, or meet the the, need, the requirements of a changing environment. So giants, gigantic animals, right, are again, subject to these forces, right? If you're living in the ocean, then change, uh, you know, and we'll see what happened to the Carcaricles megalodon, um, things are gonna change and the giants sometimes go away. Next slide. Next slide. As the oceans change, changes occurred, animals needed to increase their metabolisms. Hmm, gotta burn more food. To get more food, the animals had to become more active. Now, do you know what kind of fish that is? That's one of the most active, active fish in the ocean and one of the largest. Those are tuna. And tunas get huge and they're very active. So if you're living in an environment like the ocean that gives you lots of space, lots of potential food, you have a tendency to get gigantic. Again, increase the food. Obviously one reason that some animals become gigantic. Next slide. Giant animals need more to eat. That's a no duh. Okay, Spinosaurus there is, is what we figure it looked like, a two-legged crocodile that was 40 feet long, okay? And of course, there's our, our pal, the African elephant. Next slide. Well, increased activity requires the animals to go greater distances, okay? So not only are they aerobically more active, but they move, they're moving more. Gigantic animals require extensive feeding ranges. Of course, the buffalo, which was estimated to into the tens of millions during uh, uh, 
pre-contact here in North America and in the early years of the what, 17th and 18th century. In fact, Buffalo lived in Virginia. I mean, they, uh, so you need lots of ranges to, to get lots of food. Next slide. Well, so let's take a look at our, our buddy here, Carcaricles Megalodon. Next slide. Well, we know those, those little blue dots that you see on the map there, those are common spots where uh, megalodon teeth have been found. And yes, we have a little dot close to where Stratford Hall is because just, I mean, just last week, uh, uh, a visitor found a four and a half, four and a half inch uh, tooth. So, they, so that tells us something. The teeth are spread all over the world, mm -hmm. which would mean what? They lived all over the world. Mm -hmm. Today's blue whale is the largest animal ever and is found in almost every corner of the world except for the Arctic. So there's another case where you have a gigantic animal that has a tremendous range and is taking advantage of the unique ecosystem that oceans provide. Cool picture. Will there ever be giants in the future? New monsters. I mean, this is an artist's rendition, rendition of, of uh, and I've seen his work in, in some other periodicals. That's the reason they're numbered, if you see that. Anyway, uh, these are all fictionalized, uh, but carry out the normal growth progression of existing animals if given environmental factors that would allow some of them to become giants. Well, will there be more animals? New monsters? Uh, next, it, will there? <laughs> next slide. Uh-oh, probably not. Oh, man, where are they going? Next slide. Observations of the orca might shed light on, on something. Now, this is a very... I've been thinking about to, uh, this program today, but I was, this is a very complicated question that I am not trying to oversimplify uh, the fact that, oh, all the monsters are gone and we're not gonna have any big old animals and things like that. One of the characteristics that has been studied by biologists and paleontologists is our hunting methods. Next slide. One of the characteristics of animals these days is that they are enjoy more social and pack hunting behaviors. This is an interesting. Orcas we know do that. And of course, here are you got hyenas, African hyenas. You have you know your your wolves, and you have pride of lions. There's something about the evolutionary pressures that are creating pack hunting and social grouping to satisfy the uh, adap adaptive, ad adaptive, adaptative needs of animals working together. I think that's kind of a, I think the word is anthropomorphizing or something like that, where we gotta be careful not to, not to put human characteristics on animals necessarily, but um, there's no question that, that these animals cooperate to hunt and share the food. Is that a reason why? In fact, you know, as many things, the megalodons probably became extinct. One of the behaviors that caused their extinction was the predation of other whales and other sea mammals. The orcas being one of them. Orcas were evolving during the Miocene. And as they, as they became more adaptive to hunting, they started going after the big guys. And if there is something to, there is something to, as we observe social patterning in hunting, it's probably what took care of the megalodons. Well, that, there are other reasons, uh, climate, the ocean currents, uh, tectonics, but this is one of the big ones that's mentioned by a lot of the guys that write about it. Next. 
So both the fossil record and modern observations indicate that changing food supplies may be the main contributing factor to the reduction in the number of giants today. So the guy's holding a Carcharicles megalodon tooth from the Miocene, the white, the, that's a, uh, a uh, great white uh, tooth, you know, jaws, that's the size of his tooth now, or their tooth. So the fossil record and modern observations indicate changing food supplies, you get less giants. Change the, so again, it's a very complicated subject. I'm give, just giving you some ideas to think about as we, as we try to understand where the giants of the Miocene fit into the overall ecological history of, of this planet. Next slide. So, hey, what are some observations we can take away from this? Well, gigantic animals have lived in the past and they're still living today. Change of global climate changes result from periodic mass extinctions. There are people that are now, that are now uh, believing that we are in a sixth extinction. Interesting. Increased behavioral changes in some animals trend toward pack hunting and cooperative hunting stra survival strategies. So those are just three takeaways as we try to examine uh, why some animals get huge, basically increase, you know, it's, it's you know what it is too, guys? I hate to say this, it's luck. It's simply, there have been, you know, study after study after study looking at these big animals. Why does this one make it? Why doesn't that one make it? It's, it, you know, it, it, luck based on a series, luck is the chance of probability, the probability of survival. And the probability of survival has a lot to do with the characteristics and, and the ecological situations that we've, we've talked about in this, in this program. Food for thought. Next, next slide. I ran across this quote. I liked it. I, I don't know who said it, but life- I should like this quote. This is a good one. Yeah, life's most precious gift is uncertainty, you know? And think about that, guys. The uncertainty of life. I just got back from a delightful vacation at on the Outer Banks, where I spent a, a great deal of time looking at the ocean, and um, and thinking about the complexity and uniqueness of what we call life here on Earth, and uh, giganticism and the big guys from the past. It's just a tiny little part of of the wonders of life on this on this planet. Next slide. Absolutely. So, right. there you go. The next one's coming up on December 11th. Prepare yourself. <laughs> what is deep time? That sounds like a in-depth topic, John. It's <laughs> yeah, really. So anyway, that that's you can visit our um, uh, events pages and programs at Stratford Hall and and uh, register for that one. I'm going to take a look at what time is about. What time is it? What, what's um, we have about five minutes to look and see if we have any questions. Yes. And um, oh, I talk too much. All right, no, all right. I, I think we're good. Um, anything out there about anything? Big stuff, little stuff? I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There we go. OK, now does anybody have questions? Comments? <laughs> Please come back and, and see if, if, you, if you're still wading through all that information. <laughs> oh. Okay, so Emily asks, are giant sunfish still alive, John? Yes. Yes, and um, they, uh, and if you, I, you know, the, I don't know a whole lot about Sunfish, fascinating. Look it up, Google it. It's amazing. They're huge. All right. Um, oh, well, thank you so much for your comment, Adrienne. Um, she says, thanks for another wonderful program. 
Oh, hey, cool. Tell your friends about this, uh, about these Science Saturdays. Um, you know, it's, uh, I'll be exploring a number of, uh, of topics coming up that I think that people have questions about, thought about, and uh, I'll try to stimulate your curiosity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Linda says, very informative. Thanks. Thank you, Linda. Thanks, Linda. All right. Anybody else have any more questions? And remember, we'll have our next Science Saturday program on December 11th. Is that correct, John? That's the correct time. Yes, right. That's uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Be on the lookout for that. We'd love for everybody to sign up. Looks like we might have a couple more questions or comments. Sure. Yes, this was recorded and it will be put up on our YouTube later. Um, and uh, what is your book called? Emily asks. My book? Which book is that? Uh, is that a um, uh, paleontological or historical or what book are you referring to? I know you're out there, Emily. Emily said the fossil one. If you're talking about the book that, um, well, I've got a couple, a few of them out there. And if you're talking about the ones dealing with Stratford Hall, um, that's the geology and paleontology of Stratford Hall. If you're talking about traces and tracks and dinosaur stuff, um, you, uh, you, can, you can Google um, my name and dinosaur tracks of Fredericksburg, Virginia, and get all kinds of information. And that lists the publications. All right. I hope that helped, Emily. All right. Anybody have any more questions? Have a couple more minutes. Emily said it was the book you mentioned at the beginning of class. The book I mentioned at the yeah when we were when we were starting at the very beginning go back to the oh um, gosh I'm trying to think what did I say anyway go <laughs> back. what um, I'd have to go back and and list I mean this is sort of an extemporaneous uh, I don't have a script or anything like that I'm sort of just sort of talking uh, what was the book about. Is she responding? Emily, did you catch that? No response. Well, what we can always do is, Emily, if you want to shoot John an email, Please. Um, his, his email address is jbachman at stratfordhall.org, and we can rewatch the program, and we can yeah. try to find out what book John I, was referencing. I I um, hold on one second. <laughs> Um, Emily says that she thinks it's called Rocks, Geology, and Fossils. No, oh, 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 that's not a book. That was a series of YouTube stuff that I did for Stratford Hall called Rocks, Time, and Fossils. And you can get those also either at our website at Stratford Hall mm -hmm. or you can go them directly at YouTube. Rocks, Time, and Fossils. Sorry, yeah. Emily. No, there we go. Absolutely. Yes. So all of our programs that have been um, done are available on our YouTube channel. So please check those out if you've missed any of the, the previous Science Saturdays or John's um, short lectures on rocks, uh, time, time, and fossil. Absolutely. absolutely. And then there's other um, virtual programs on there as well. Yeah. So um, thank you all so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. We hope that you'll tune in next time. Um, last chance for questions, anybody? No? Well, no. thank you okay. all. We appreciate it. Um, continue to support Stratford Hall. John, thank you for your time and Good. all of the wonderful information today. Um, and 
you know, we hope you all join us next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody.